Thank you for coming. Tonight's Food Preservation 101. Just in time for all of us to get the good stuff out of our gardens and then instead of sneaking it onto our neighbor's porches, we can preserve it and enjoy it ourselves this winter. Um, our guest tonight is Rachel Wall. And I'm going to let you say what your job is because you've got a really long oh, title. Wow. But she works for the Iowa State Extension Office. Great. So, and she's here to teach us all about Food Preservation 101. Thank you very much. As she mentioned, my name is Rachel Wall. I am a human scientist specialist uh, in the nutrition and health area, and I'm also a registered dietitian. So I work for Iowa State University, actually, um, but my office is here in Iowa City. So extension and outreach is associated with each land-grant institution and university in the country, and our job is to share information with the citizens across the state. So that's why I'm based here in Iowa City and not in Ames. Um, tonight I'm going to give you some background on food preservation, kind of give you some of the basics and then hopefully help you feel confident enough to do this at home or I'll be sharing at the end we have some hands-on workshops that you can attend if you're interested in learning more information. But first um, I'd like you, well first I have an intern I'd like to introduce. Um, I have a dietetic intern with me these next couple weeks, Alyssa Beavers, um, so she'll be here assisting me. and. There's handouts over on the side. If you haven't had a chance to get those, feel free to walk over and pick some up. There's a variety of handouts, so whichever interests you, um, feel free to take those. Before we get into the nitty gritty details, I wanted to just go over some basic food safety concepts um, that apply anytime you're working with food. So hand washing is always going to be important. This is the number one way to prevent the spread of different foodborne illnesses or food poisoning. So before we handle any food, um, anytime we really touch any part of our hair or face or body, when we use the restroom, um, before handling meat, um, if we have pets, those are all times when we want to make sure we wash our hands. This goes over the proper procedures for washing fresh produce. Um, so just to highlight, you want to make sure that your hands are washed and that your work surfaces are cleaned and sanitized. Um, your raw vegetables you want to wash under running water and you want to think about giving it a shower and not a bath. So you, want, you don't want to soak it in water because that's not going to um, help remove some of the contaminants. So you want to make sure you're washing it under running water. Um, <clears throat> and then if you have items that have a harder skin on them, like a potato or we were talking about turnips or jicama earlier, um, it may be helpful to have a vegetable brush to scrub away some of that dirt on there that can be trickier to remove and then labeling and dating items <clears throat> is important as well. Um, once we've cut any tomatoes or lettuce or melons, we want to make sure that we refrigerate those especially um, because they've been known to be linked with a lot of foodborne illnesses. So we want to make sure we stick those in the fridge at 41 degrees or lower. Okay, I'm just going to touch briefly on knife skills um, because often we're going to be cutting up things while we're preparing them to fit into our jars or when we're freezing them. There's a variety of knives that you can purchase. Um, most often we're going to be using a parry knife or a chef knife. Um, you can also get more specialty knives like the tom tomato knife that is shown here. It's important when you're handling a knife um, that when you have your chef knife, you wrap your fingers around it and that your thumb is on the other side. Um, and then you want to create a claw grip. So you want to um, hold your fingers back so that you're, it's not tempting to accidentally grab um, one of your ends of your fingers when you're cutting. So make sure you pull back your fingers as shown here in the picture. Um, and then use, use that hand as a guiding hand for the knife when you're cutting. Um, this just goes over some different knife cutting techniques. So depending on how large the item is will depend on where you place your knife. Um, so technique one is for large items that are going to sit higher on the cutting board. Um, you're going to start with the tip of the blade on the object as shown here. If you have smaller things like herbs, um, celery, or carrots, you're going to start with the tip of the knife actually on the cutting board. Um, and then the third technique is a rocking motion, generally to mince herbs or garlic, um, and that's shown on the bottom here. <clears throat> the important thing, yeah, I'll mention this here, um, is that you're using the length of the knife. So we don't want to hear lots of chopping sounds. You want to hear more of a gliding sound so that you're using the length of the knife to help you rather than having your arm do all of the work while you're cutting. 
So just to save yourself a little work and to help um, use the tool as it's intended. This shows our workstation setup. Um, so and they're in a commercial kitchen here. Most of us will probably be in our homes when we're preparing these. But again, just making sure that um, everything is in place, we refer to that as mise en place. Um, because in the canning process, especially, um, the steps can come up rather quickly. So it's important that you have all your materials gathered and you're not running around your kitchen um, trying to find things. So these are the three main types of food preservation we're going to be talking about tonight. We're going to spend a significant amount of the time talking about canning, um, both hot water bath canning or boiling water bath canning, as some of you mentioned, and then also the pressure canning. And then we'll also touch on freezing and dehydrating. Um, as a aside, I will say um, freezing and dehydrating are not um, as risky or as my predecessor says, they won't put you on my worry list as much as canning. So canning is something that you especially um, need to follow all of the steps. There's lots of opportunities to be creative in cooking. Canning is not one of those. So we want to make sure that we're always following the recipe um, to make sure that we're um, coming out with a safe product. So with canning, as you can see here, some of the equipment and supplies you'll need. <clears throat> so with canning, we're creating a vacuum. So we're drawing air out of the jar, creating um, an anaerobic environment so that we can minimize the growth of um, the microorganisms. Also by heating the jars and the contents in them, we're destroying those microorganisms and inactivating some of the enzymes present in the food that can cause changes in the color and flavor of the food. So there are several purposes to the canning process. So when we're canning, we want to choose high quality produce. So the way that the item is when you get it, it's not going to um, become any better through canning it. So if you are canning bruised or blemished products, that's how they're going to end up in your jar as well. So you want to choose high quality items. Um, we're going to be heating the food to a temperature that destroys those microorganisms and inactivates those enzymes. So depending on which type of canning we're using, the temperature will vary and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, that vacuum is created by driving air out of the jar. So that popping sound that you hear is that vacuum being formed. Um, so that's often heard when you're removing the jars from the canner. Um, the seal also helps to hold the lid on the jar, so that's going to be important, and prevents anything else from getting into the food. So we don't want those items becoming recontaminated. And we also um, want to prevent air from getting in there so that the food doesn't dry out, because a lot of these items, um, you're making them shelf stable. So something that normally would require being um, processed in a certain way or put in our refrigerator or freezer, we're making it so we can safely put it on a shelf for an extended amount of time. So we need to make sure that we're um, doing all these things uh, to prevent those food safety risks that can come into play. So we have two types of canning, as I mentioned. We have the hot water bath or the boiling water bath canning or the pressure canning. Now the type of canner we use depends on the acidity or the pH of the food. Um, so that's what's going to determine which type of canning uh, we need to use. So the pH scale, I don't know if you guys can remember back to chemistry class, goes from 0 to 14. 7 is in the middle, so that's fairly neutral. Um, foods that have a pH lower than 7 are considered acidic, and those um, or things higher than um, 7 are considered more basic. However, when we're talking about canning, we consider foods to be acidic if their pH is below 4.6. So this is going to be most fruits except for figs and Asian pears. Um, tomatoes that have been properly acidified. So the recipe will tell you you need to either add lemon juice or citric acid or um, some kind of acid to them um, to properly acidify them. And the reason we need to acidify our tomatoes is because amongst the varieties there's not a consistent amount of acid in the tomatoes. So the recipes recommend that we add the acid to them um, as a precautionary measure. And then foods that have acid added to them. So this would be pickled items. So this could be pickled cucumbers. If you're doing pickled carrots, as I have up here, um, where you're adding a large amount of acid to them. Salsa would be another example because we're adding vinegar, which is an acid. So these are all foods that can be safely done in a boiling water bath um, or hot water bath canner. Our low acid foods, so those that have a pH above 4.6, 
are going to be our vegetables and also our meats, poultry, and seafood. And then mixtures of high and low acid foods, so things like spaghetti sauce or soups. These all need to be done in a pressure canner for safety. So why is that? <clears throat> well, in a boiling water bath canner, the water at sea level is going to boil at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so this is going to be safe for our high acid foods. However, our foods that um, don't have as much acid in them aren't able to inhibit the growth of those harmful microorganisms. So when we sit them on a shelf, it's a lot easier for those microorganisms to grow. So we need to heat them to a higher temperature, which is only achieved in a pressure canner. So this goes up to um, at least 240 degrees, and that can be used, that's what we need to use for our low acid foods or mixtures of high and low acid foods. Questions on any of this? Yes, green beans would fall under vegetables, so that needs to be done in a pressure canner. Unless you're pickling it, then you can do it in a hot water bath canner. Okay, so in the pressure canner, when we um, are able to create pressure in there, we're able to increase the temperature. So that's how we're able to get up to at least 240 degrees. Altitude is another consideration you need to take into, um, take into consideration. Um, because as you increase in um, elevation, water is going to boil at a lower temperature. So um, you need to think about either adjusting the processing time. If you're using a boiling water bath canner, you're going to increase the amount of time. And on the recipe, um, it will tell you how much time to add. And I'll tell you about, talk to you about where you need to look for recipes. And then if you're doing something in a pressure canner, then um, you're either going to increase the time or the pressure that you're using. So um, if you're at above 1,000 feet, you'll need to increase the time. And then if you're doing pressure canning, um, there are two main types of pressure canners. So you can either have a dial gauge canner. Um, so that would be where there's a dial on here and it goes from zero to 20 and that will tell you what the pressure is at. Or you can have a weighted gauge canner such as this one. So this has three different weights on it. By itself, it's five pounds. So if the recipe says to process at five pounds, um, you'll place the weight on here. And when this rocks or jiggles, that's an indication that it's reached the correct pressure. And then each ring is five additional pounds. So this would mean that I'm processing at 10 pounds. And then the second ring would be for processing at 15 pounds. Um, so you'll either need to, again, increase um, the time or the weight. Now I have some good news. <coughs> oh, I don't know why that's not showing up. Um, we're in Johnson County here. So shaded areas on this map are less than 1,000 feet. So we don't need to worry about adjusting um, processing times for altitude. However, if you are in any other part of the state that's a non-shaded county, you will need to um, take into consideration because these are going to be above 1,000 feet. So you will need to adjust for the altitude. So who's heard of botulism? Does that sound familiar? It's kind of a scary term, isn't it? Um, that's, that's one of the things that we need to be concerned about when we are canning. And the reason why... Oh, there you go. Okay, um, so botulism is a foodborne illness um, and it thrives in environments where there's not a lot of acid. So think about our vegetables, our meats, um, our mixtures of high acid foods. There's not a lot of acid in that environment to inhibit the growth of these spores. Um, so they form protective heat resistant spores and it requires a high, very high temperature for them to be destroyed. So they're not going to be destroyed at 212 degrees in a boiling water bath canner. So that's why we need to pr um, process those low acid foods in a pressure canner. So if someone has consumed something with these spores, they're going to get sick um, relatively soon. Some of the common GI um, or digestive upset symptoms that are common with foodborne illnesses, they may have double vision, difficulty swallowing, breathing, paralysis, and it can eventually lead to death. So we want to avoid this at all costs. It is rare, there's about 
50 to 55 cases in the United States each year of people who um, fatalities associated with this. Um, so we just want to avoid this at all costs because this is not uh, what we want to happen. Are they getting it from canned food? Uh, those are the ones from canned food. So there could be ones from other sources. Um, these spores are found commonly in the west in like Colorado and those soils. So I don't think it's as common in the soil here, but there's still a risk involved. So that's why we always want to follow a tested recipe um, and use the appropriate kind of canning method. So again, that's why we need to use a pressure canner for these low acid foods because they don't contain enough acid in them um, to prevent uh, the growth of these spores. And we can reach um, 240 degrees in the pressure canner. So again, this um, canned foods is kind of the perfect environment for these to grow. We have the temperature danger zone, which is 40 to 140 degrees. So room temperature falls within that range. So once we've set our products out, there's often a lot of moisture in the jar. It's uh, no air or an anaerobic environment, which is what they prefer. And there's not a lot of acidity. So that is kind of how this can, um, the spores can germinate and then if consumed can be very harmful. So we want to avoid this scenario at all costs. Okay, so now getting into the equipment. Um, there is some items that you'll need for canning. There's not a huge startup cost, but there are some important pieces of equipment. Um, first, you need to think about your jars and your lids. Uh, we recommend using the canning jars, which again is a wonderful door prize you guys have tonight. Um, we don't recommend mayonnaise type jars or things like that. So we want jars that are intended for canning. Um, the other jars may have already been scratched with a metal knife or something and that could temper the jar and make it easy to crack or break. So um, we want to make sure that they are able to sustain um, the stresses that go on when you're canning. And also the lids that you're using. So the jars are reusable, you can reuse these. And you can also reuse the screw bands. Um, the actual lids though are one time use only. So the sealing compound only works one time. So otherwise though, the other items you can wash and reuse. Again, the appropriate kind of canner. So you wanna think about if you're gonna be doing pressure canning with your low acid food, um, do you want a dial gauge, or um, which is shown on the bottom here, or a weighted gauge canner um, shown right here? So again, this dial goes from about zero to 20 pounds of pressure. Um, some people prefer the dial gauge because it will tell them exactly what the pressure is rather than the weighted gauge. You have to wait to hear it rocking, and sometimes people aren't sure if it's rocking enough or too much. So that may be one reason why you want to purchase a dial gauge. However, the dial gauge canner lids need to be calibrated each year. So you need to, um, you can bring them down to me at the extension office here and I can test it for you for free. Um, but that's just to make sure that it's correctly um, reading the right pressure. If you have a weighted gauge, you don't need to calibrate those. So it kind of depends on your preference. Yes. Good question. Do we need to give her the mic? Or? Okay. okay. The question was, um, if you lost the, it was the weight on there, on your canner, what can you do? Um, the best thing I would say is call the manufacturer and they can tell you um, if they're still making that type of weight and where to get one at, or they can, you can purchase one from them. Um, hardware stores and even like Walmart and Hy-Vee sell canning supplies. So you can look to see in the stores if they sell it as well. So, good question. Can I just ask something mm -hmm. about the botulism? Okay. Can, can you, when you open the jar, you wouldn't be able to taste it or smell it? Correct. Often you can't, uh, the question was regarding botulism, and often you can't taste, smell, or see it. Okay. So that's, again, why it can be so harmful. Um, so those are the uh, pressure canners that you want to think about. Um, and I've seen those for sale at hardware stores as well. Um, for a hot water bath canner, you can use a large stock pot as shown here. You need to think about something that um, once you put the jars in, there can be at least be one to two inches of water covering it. So you need something deep enough um, for that. So you can use a large stock pot. You can use your pressure canner also as a hot water bath canner um, if you would like. Um, 
the one thing that's kind of tricky with that is you need to make sure the water's constantly boiling and since these don't have clear lids, sometimes it's hard to tell that. Um, so that's just something you need to be mindful of. And then the stove top is also something. So gas ranges are actually the best for canning because you can control the heat relatively easy. Then electric, and then um, the least favorable are the flat top stove, which I know are very common now. Um, if you have a flat top and you're gonna be doing some canning on it, you wanna call the manufacturer and see if it's been tested for that. The reason is because um, the flat tops scratch or crack easily, especially when you're moving the canner across them. And then when you're getting up to really high temperatures, especially when you're pressure canning, the heat can reflect back onto the stove and it can cause it to crack or break. Or some of them have automatic shutoffs once they get too hot. And so it's really important that we're maintaining constant heat and pressure when we're canning. And if the heating element goes off, then we have to start the process all over again. So gas is best, um, but if you do have a flat top, call the manufacturer to make sure it's okay to um, use for canning. Okay, when we set up our boiling water bath canner, um, again I said we need to um, have one to two inches covering the jar. If it's a longer processing time, you're gonna need more water because it will evaporate. Um, but if it's like jams or jellies where you're only processing five minutes, um, one or one and a half inches should be adequate. And you also want to keep the jars off the bottom of the canner, um, so you don't want that heat contact where they're sitting directly on the bottom. So you can uh, make your own um, jar rack like this out of the screw bands. Um, this is kind of the homemade version. Or if you have a uh, pressure canner, often they come with one on the inside. So just something to hold the jars so they're not um, directly in contact with the bottom of the canner. Um, and then oftentimes you can purchase racks. I don't think I brought mine tonight, but this um, you can lower in to the water so that you're not having to put your hands in the boiling hot water and then a lid to cover it. Okay, pressure canning is a little more uh, complex. So again, we have the dial gauge here or the weighted gauge here, which is gonna help us tell us what the pressure is um, in there. We also have um, the handles here, so those are important that you screw those on tightly so that you formed a good seal. We don't want any air to escape because that's going to prevent us from um, generating any pressure inside of the canner. Uh, we still have our jar rack, so we're keeping those things off the bottom of our canner. <clears throat> um, you'll also notice that there is a safety fuse over here, so if you see that come off or go off, that means that um, you're reaching dangerous levels of pressure, so you want to turn the heat off and move your canner off the, um, off the burner. The vent or cover lock over here just means that you've generated pressure. So oftentimes um, this will come up and that tells us that we've established pressure inside the canner. Now after we um, are done canning, or let's say the processing time is 20 minutes, so we've canned it for 20 minutes. Um, before we can take uh, the jars out, we need to let it depressurize naturally. So we don't want to, we want to let it do its thing on its own. So we want to leave the weight on um, and we need to wait for this to come completely down and that can take 30 minutes to an hour. So you need to allow plenty of time um, and then you need to wait 10 more minutes and then you can take the jars out. So there's lots of time involved with canning. So you need to make sure you have adequate time to do all the steps. Okay, so there's a difference between a pressure canner and a pressure cooker. Pressure canners are for canning, um, pressure cookers are not. Uh, they don't have a large enough volume oftentimes to reach the adequate um, heat and pressure that we need to penetrate the inside of the jar to heat the food properly enough. Um, the pressure canners we're using need to be at least large enough to hold at least four quart sized jars. So, um, if you do have a pressure cooker at home, you can use it for other um, methods of, you know, preparing meats or whatever you use it for, but for canning, we need to make sure we use a pressure canner. Okay, here's the cooktops we talked about. Um, so again, with the flat bottom, you need to be conscious of the scratching. If there's any overheat protection, um, think about that. Um, and also matching the burner size to the pot. So we want to make sure we're using um, a burner that's 
usually the largest burner since our canners are fairly large. Um, we don't want the canner to be one to two inches uh, wider in diameter than the canner that we're using. The processing times um, that you'll see on the approved and tested recipes are determined by research. So the National Center for Home Food Preservation is a great resource. Um, they're based out of the University of Georgia and they are the ones who test all of these recipes and determine what the adequate processing time is for, um, for these different foods. So they'll determine how much time and temperature is needed to penetrate the jar to heat the food in the middle where it's often the coldest. Um, so there's a variety of factors that influence the processing times, the thickness of the food, um, the size of the jar you're using, um, the altitude, again we said that can determine how quickly the water boils, the consistency of the liquid in um, your canned product, so all of these factors go, come into play. These are considered unacceptable methods of canning. So again we talked about the two safe methods are using a boiling water bath canner or a pressure canner. There's lots of other ideas and shortcuts out there for canning, but they're not safe and we don't recommend them. Um, so even if you see it on Pinterest or on the internet and your friend is raving about it, please don't do it. Um, so some of the things wouldn't be using a boiling water bath canner for low acid food. So like if we use that to try to process carrots or green beans or something like that, we don't recommend that. Sealing jams and jellies with paraffin Oven canning was especially popular last year, so you place the jars in the oven. Um, the thing with oven canning is it's a dry heat method and not a moist heat method like you're doing in um, the canning we've been discussing. And so the heat isn't able to penetrate the jar as well. So just think you can stick your arm in a 350 degree oven and be okay, but you can't put your arm into boiling water. <laughs> it's, gonna, it's gonna burn yourself. So um, we don't recommend that. No microwave canning or dishwasher canning. So take home message is to always use a USDA approved and tested recipe. So where can you find those? In all of the handouts I have over there include USDA tested and approved recipes. The National Center for Home Food Preservation, they have a great website that you can use and they also have a publication you can purchase called So Easy to Preserve. Um, so these are all tested and approved recipes. and. Um, Again, on their website, you can find most of these recipes as well. So if you are internet savvy, you can go on there and um, purchase those. This also includes freezing and dehydrating. Yes, so this is kind of like the Bible of food preservation, if you will. Um, so this is a great resource. And then Ball Blue Book is also another good resource as well. Yes. Uh -huh. Oh. Good question. Um, so open kettle canning is when you um, cook the food and then just pour it into hot jars and then just put the lid on and you don't process it in a pressure canner or a boiling water bath canner. So you kind of skip that step. Um, and so even though the jar may seal, you haven't safely sealed it using one of these methods. So um, we don't recommend the open kettle or I think it's also called steam kettle canning. We don't rec recommend that. So there's methods that you can use for um, packing the food when you're canning. So you can put the food raw into the jars or you can heat it first and then put it into the jars. That's referred to as hot pack. Um, kind of depends on your preference. Raw pack, um, you're gonna cover with boiling water or juice or syrup and then tightly pack it. With the hot pack, um, you're gonna cook the food for a certain amount of time. It will tell you in the recipe what that is. And then pack the food in there and then cover with um, a liquid and you're going to pack that more loosely since it's already been cooked. Um, one thing that's advantageous with the hot pack is that when you're cooking the food um, you're going to um, help remove some of those air pockets that are in the food and in the uh, cells of the food so it's not going to float when it gets into the jar. Whereas when you raw pack foods oftentimes um, it may be floating off the bottom of the jar um, because there's still some of those air cells in the food. And we'll talk about how that may affect your headspace in a second. So when we are packing our jars, there's several things to consider. <clears throat> um, and several tools you might want to consider purchasing if you don't already, already have them. Uh, one thing that's really nice to have is a funnel so that um, the food easily falls into the jar. Um, especially if you have 
uh, liquid products like salsas or things. I think the funnel works really well. And then you need to release the air bubbles. So you can use a plastic spatula. We don't want to use um, anything metal because that, again, can scratch the jar and can make it easier to crack or break. Or you can use um, one of these. This is dual purpose. So on this end, you can go around the side of the jar and through the middle to remove any air bubbles. And then on this end, you're able to measure the head space. And that's the space between the top of the food and the jar. And um, the head space is really important because um, if you have too little head space, and we'll talk about this in a second, then um, the product can actually boil over and the jar won't seal correctly. And if you, if you leave too much head space, like I've done here with my chicken, <laughs> you guys can all see that, um, then the product can discolor. So it's important that you follow the correct amount of headspace. So this is going to be a quarter of inch for jams and jellies, a half inch for um, fruits, tomatoes, and pickles, and then one to one, one and one fourth inches for low acid foods. So that would be things like the chicken does need more headspace, but we, we left too much. So. So again, the headspace, and on some jars, actually, there, the threads on the jars indicate how much headspace there is. So um, down to the, the main lip here is one inch. Um, and then you can see the one and a half inch indicated there. So those are kind of some cheaters. But I usually like to use this. So each stair step is a quarter of an inch. So you can just place it on the jar for how much headspace is needed. Um, okay. So again, headspace is important to make sure your jar properly seals. So this shows some of the steps. So after we have um, heated our food, if we're doing a hot pack or if it's raw pack, we've packed it into the jars. Um, our jars, when we use them, we need to make sure that they're cleaned and sterilized. So if you are not processing anything in a hot water bath or a um, yeah, hot water bath for more than 10 minutes, it needs to be sterilized, so you'll need to heat it um, in hot water. I believe it's 180 degrees. <clears throat> um, if you're processing for more than 10 minutes, though, then they consider that enough time to sterilize the jars. Uh, after you place the food in and measure the headspace, make sure that that's correct. You want to wipe the rim of the jars with a wet paper towel or a wet rag to remove any food debris. <coughs> Excuse me. And then I like to use a magnetic wand. Um, this comes in a kit you can get with like a funnel and with the bubble freer. And place the uh, lid on here. This is nice too because you're not using your hands to contaminate the jar at all. And then you want to put place on the screw band until it's fingertip tight. So you're just going to screw it on there. You don't need to crank it really hard. Um, just till you feel some resistance and then another about quarter inch turn. Now, you'll notice the lids were placed in a, a saucepan. You just want to place them in um, hot water, so about 140 degrees. You don't want it to be boiling, um, but the hot water will help activate the sealing compound so it forms a better seal. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, then you're going to place the jars into the canner. And where did my thing go? Here we go. So this is really nifty. This um, is a jar lifter that you can use to place the jars into the canner. Um, I recommend one because we don't want to, um, thank you, hurt our hands when we're doing this or our arms. Um, the important thing to remember when you're lifting the jars up and down is that you're not tilting the jars because that can cause food to get under the um, lid and interfere with the seal being formed. So what about think keeping a stiff arm as we're going up and down? and putting the food into the canner. OK, after you've placed it in the canner, um, we're going to put the lid on, process for the adequate amount of time. So here we have a, looks like a boiling, well, actually, I can't tell. This is a boiling, I think it's a boiling water bath canner because it's salsa. Um, so make sure that, again, there's one to two inches of water covering the jars. Um, process for the amount of time listed in the recipe. The water needs to be boiling the entire time. Or if you have a pressure canner, you need to make sure that the pressure is maintained at the correct pressure the entire time. If the water stops boiling or if the pressure drops, you need to start the entire process over again. So to avoid that, it's important that, 
again, you're using, making sure you're watching it, keeping a close eye on it. Um, with the boiling water bath canner, after the allotted time is up, you can remove it from the heat and then you need to wait 10 minutes before you take the jars out. After those 10 minutes are up, you can remove the jars. Notice how they are keeping the jars straight up and down and then lowering them straight. They're not tilting them at all. It's going to be really tempting, especially when you take the jars out, because there's going to be water on them. Just let it be. Let it evaporate. Um, I know it's going to be tempting, too, to wipe them off, um, but pressing on the lids can make it difficult for the vacuum and the seal to form. So just leave it alone. The next day, you can wipe off any of the water residue. Um, and then when you're letting them cool, uh, you want to place a uh, towel or something on your countertop because they're going to be very hot and leave one to two inches between the jars so that they can cool. And you need to leave them undisturbed for 12 to 24 hours. So you don't want to touch them at all. We're just going to let them be. Um, we don't want to retighten the screw bands either after we've processed them. And you're going to be hearing that popping sound as the jars cool. Again, making sure that the recipe we're using is up to date and a tested USDA tested recipe. So after the 12 to 24 hours, um, you're going to listen for that sound. If you um, hear a dull sound, the jar may not be sealed and you c it could be stuck on there, but within a day it should form that seal. If not, then put it in the fridge and you have seven days to eat it. So you should hear um, the popping sound. Also you can tap it with a spoon and then when you look at it at eye level, it should be concave. And also, um, before you store them, we're actually going to remove the screw bands. So when you take the screw band off and put your fingers under here, this shouldn't be able to pop off easily. So there, you shouldn't be able to pull, pop that off. If it does pop off or slide off, that means it didn't form a seal. So you're going to want to put it in the fridge and use it within seven days. So when we're storing our canned uh, goods, Again, the screw band we want to remove, the reason is because they can rust on, and so that can make it really difficult to take off. I have kept mine on just because it's easier for transport, um, but if I was using these for home use, I would have taken the screw bands off. Um, this is when you can wash off the jars, get off any of the water or the water stains, uh, labeling and dating the products, and then store in a cool, dry, and dark place, um, like a basement or a cellar. Between 50 and 70 degrees is ideal. And we recommend using um, home canned food products within one year for best quality. Okay, so this is a little um, activity for you guys. So you're going to see a picture of some food items, and you're going to tell me if this needs to be done in a pressure canner or a boiling water bath canner. Oh, gosh, that answer's not supposed to show up. Why did it do that? Oh, man. Okay, well, maybe. Okay, well, I apologize. I don't know why that's showing up. Um, but yes, so this would be a boiling water bath canner. We've got our fruit, and then these cucumbers we're going to be pickling, so that would be in a boiling water bath canner. We have uh, green beans and carrots, so there's going to be a low acid food. Unless we're pickling them or we're adding a lot of vinegar usually to increase the acidity, we're going to um, process those in a pressure canner. One note about um, the acidity, or when you're adding acid to foods, if you're using vinegar, you want to make sure that it's 5% acidity vinegar. Uh, most vinegar in the store has that on their label, but again, that's what the amount is tested in these recipes, so you want to make sure that it's 5% acidity. Pressure canner for our uh, meat and fish. And then a boiling water bath canner, so we have our fruit, our peaches, <clears throat> and then with our salsa, we're adding significant amounts of acid, so those can be done in a boiling water bath canner. <clears throat> so like shown here, because so, we've got like corn and peas and potatoes, um, so a lot of low acid foods in there. Um, another thing with canning, so again, making sure we're always following a recipe, we don't want to... Um, alter the liquid either that we're using in there. So if it says to pour over um, water or a syrup, make sure you direct it, prepare it as directed. Um, I've heard of some people wanting to make like pie filling or something where they're adding starch or thickeners to it. That um, inhibits or 
um, slows down the heat penetration in the jar and so it often doesn't get processed correctly. So don't add thickeners or anything like that, flour, um, because that can um, affect the processing time. Okay, next we're going to talk about freezing. <clears throat> so canning has lots of detailed steps. Um, freezing, you still need to follow a couple things, um, but you're not going to be on my worry list as much as when canning um, because you're keeping the food at temperatures that um, oftentimes prevent pathogen growth. So we're not going to um, find as many of those harmful items in our food. So again, when we're freezing, we're preventing the growth of those harmful microorganisms and also slowing the enzyme activity. So those enzymes in the food are what cause changes in the flavor and the texture and the color of the food product. Um, so oftentimes when we are harvesting the foods, that's what we want to keep it at. So if we don't um, take some steps for certain items, then we can see changes in our product. <clears throat> How many of you have heard of bird's eye frozen vegetables? So that's where the quick freeze process came. So that means um, freezing foods quickly. Um, so that means putting them in at temperatures often um, fairly cold, like negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit, um, to um, form a quick uh, frozen product with even consistency. So there are several factors that affect the quality of frozen food. So the enzymes, again, in the food that cause those changes, um, air, um, the air in freezers is very dry, so that can affect the, if you have a lot of air that gets in contact with the food, that's what causes freezer burn. Um, ice crystals can form, so that's when um, these frozen foods, the cells expand, and then if we get lots of ice crystal formation, that can cause the cells to burst and make the foods mushy and the quality isn't as good. And then evaporation of moisture. So when we're freezing foods, we're not stopping the enzyme activity. Um, with our fruits, meats, and grain products, these are generally going to be unaffected. So we don't really need to um, do anything special to them before you freeze them with regards to stopping enzyme activity. However, with vegetables, um, if they are not blanched, they're often going to lose their quality. So we want to make sure that we blanch those. And what that means, I don't, think, I don't know if we have a slide on this. Um, placing them into boiling water for a set amount of time, usually two to three minutes. There's a handout over here that discusses that for different vegetables. And then you're going to submerge it into ice water for the same amount of time. So that's what's going to um, help delay some of that enzyme activity. Um, also air, so we want to um, prevent some of those enzymatic reactions. We've all cut a banana and left it out and then it's turned brown or apples or things like that. Um, <clears throat> so we want to prevent that air contact. Um, also, the air can deteriorate the flavor in fats and oils and promote freezer burn. So we want to minimize the time that um, the product is in contact with air. So that's why it's important that we're using um, containers that are intended for freezing, also wrapping things like meats and fish in freezer paper, and using the freezer bags can help prevent that. Um, contact with air. So the ice crystals again cause that soft mushy undesired texture none of us want. Um, so if we freeze the items fast and at a constant temperature that can help prevent some of that. So this means we're not constantly opening and shutting our freezer door and also that we haven't overfilled our freezer. So the cold air circulating is what helps keep freeze the products and keep them frozen. If we have it packed full, that air can't circulate and the products can't freeze as quickly. Um, also, even at a lower temperature, so the negative 10 Fahrenheit, I said, um, it's going to have smaller ice crystals than at zero degrees. What temperature are the fridges at? Um, it should be at least at zero degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. Fridges um, should be between 32 and 41. Um, also, the way we wrap our items, so to prevent that moisture loss, so again, using freezer paper, as I said, um, <clears throat> so they're not, we're not losing as much color, flavor, and texture in the products. These are some of the packaging characteristics we want to look for. Um, so something that's moisture and vapor resistant, um, it's not going to leak all over our freezer, um, protection from off flavors, and also something that we can easily seal and label. So these are some 
good items um, to have on hand if you don't and you're freezing lots of things. So rigid containers, especially if you're freezing something that's a liquid so that it can stay in uh, one piece, um, flexible bags or wrappings or laminated freezer papers. These are not as desirable because they're going to cause some of that moisture and vapor loss. So wax paper, um, paper or cardboard cartons, um, something with a poorly fitting lid, or if you're reusing like plastic dairy containers or things like that. Um, so they may have uses for other things like in your fridge if you have leftovers, but as far as freezing, they're not going to maintain the quality of the products as well. Oftentimes you can also use canning jars um, and freeze things in those as well. Most of them are freezer safe. You'll just want to look on the label when you purchase them. <clears throat> so these are some uh, examples of things you may want to include on the label. So the name of the item when it was um, packaged, um, the pack type. So here they have light syrup when it was packed. So just some general tips, freeze items quickly allow adequate space so that the cold air can circulate and maintain at least a zero degrees Fahrenheit temperature. Yes. So if you have berries, raspberries or blueberries, mm -hmm. is it best to put them like on a flat tray and freeze them individually and Good. then put them in the container? Good question. Yeah. So um, she was referring to the individual quick freeze process where you freeze items first individually and then place them into a larger bag. Um, that is desirable, like for berries or things where you want them separate, because when you take them out of the bag, they're not going to clump together as much. Um, so yes, that is something we recommend. And on the freezing handout, it talks about that as well. So that's a good question. And tomatoes, mm -hmm. yep. So just need to have like cookie sheets or something to place it on and then... Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, I think my next slide, I think one of the next couple slides addresses that. Um, so when we're freezing food, um, the fruit, again, you want to select ripe items that are good quality, rinse them first. Again, we want to give it a shower, not a bath, and then freeze quickly. With our vegetables, we want, um, again, young, tender, high quality vegetables. Um, I'm not a gardener, but from what I've heard, it's best to pick them right in the morning when the dew is off of them. Um, and then you want to process the foods as quickly to when it was harvested as possible. So maybe think about if you have a weekend or something where you have time to harvest it right after you, or process it right after you harvest it. And then um, blanch before freezing our vegetables. So again, there's several purposes to the blanching process. Stopping the enzyme activity can also get rid of um, the dirt and microbes on there and also makes them easier to package because you're going to soften the vegetables. We want to make sure we do it for the correct amount of time. Um, you're not going to get as good of quality if you under blanch and then over blanching you're going to get nutrient flavor and color loss. So that's when you just kind of cook, cook it forever. <laughs> um, with meats, when you're freezing those, um, they should be wrapped or rewrapped um, for quality. So when you get back from the store, um, if you're going to be keeping it for a long time in your freezer, you'll want to put another layer of the freezer paper around it. Our fatty meats and fish, cured meats and shellfish, have about a three-month shelf life in our freezer. Um, other meats have a longer um, quality, so about one year can be kept in the freezer. Uh, with other products, so pasteurized, homogenized milk can be um, a month, cream three to four months, and butter, lard, and margarine um, up to six months. Four, yep. This is mainly for quality. Um, so, I mean, you can keep things for a, a very long time in your freezer and be safe, but the quality of it is going to be compromised. So that's primarily what these recommendations are based on. Mm -hmm. These are items that do not work well when you freeze them, and that's because they have a high water content in them. Um, and so think about those cell walls are going to be um, breaking lots of ice crystals can be forming, and so they're going to have a really mushy texture. So cabbage, lettuce, celery, cucumbers, radishes, and potatoes uh, don't work well to freeze. So you may want to think about canning these items or possibly um, dehydrating them, which we'll talk about in a second. 
Um, you can also freeze herbs and um, spices. Just think about there may be some flavor changes that will be occurring. <clears throat> When we're thawing our frozen food, there's four acceptable ways to thaw food. So we can thaw it in the um, cooler or in our fridge under cool running water. Um, we can put it in cold water that's changed out every 30 minutes or in the microwave um, as long as we cook it immediately after. So when we thaw something in the microwave, we can't put it back in the fridge. We need to cook it. Notice that thawing on the counter is not an acceptable method. So. Um, I grew up with that and I harp on my mom about it all the time, but leaving a package of meat out overnight is not um, considered safe because that food is exposed to that temperature danger zone because room temperature is between 40 and 140 degrees. Um, so that is a good environment where those um, microorganisms can grow. Okay, dehydrating is our last topic. Um, so this is actually the oldest method of food preservation. Um, many people, when they were uh, coming over from Europe on ships and things, uh, dehydrated their foods because it was light storage and the food um, didn't, lasted for a significant amount of time. So it's inexpensive. It's um, also it doesn't take up as much storage space and it concentrates the flavor and the nutrition of the products. So when we're dehydrating foods, we're essentially removing the water from the product. Um, you can reconstitute it by adding water to it if later. Um, the two main things that we need to think about are controlling the temperature and the air circulation while we are drying the foods. Um, if we aren't careful about these things, then the food can spoil while we're drying it, and we want to prevent that from happening. So we have two recommended methods of de dehydrating food either in a dehydrator as shown here or in an oven. We don't recommend sun or solar drying. Uh, several reasons. First, um, the temperature fluctuates a lot. Um, so you don't know, you know if it's going to evenly dehydrate and it can take a very long time. So it could spoil while it's out there. And also there could be rodents or birds flying by leaving droppings on your food. So as far as contamination, it's not um, very sanitary either. So a dehydrator is going to be yield the best quality product for dehydrating food. So if you're going to be doing a lot of dehydrating, I would encourage you to look into purchasing one. Um, it's not dependent on the weather, it's sanitary, and it's also going to be um, about two to three times quicker than dehydrating in the oven. If you do decide to um, dehydrate in the oven, your oven setting needs to go down to 140, 250 degrees. So not all ovens go down that low. And then the door needs to be kept ajar two to four inches to allow air circulation. So Maeve was telling me about, um, she has a dog. So if you have pets or little kids running around, you wanna make sure that they stay out of the kitchen area while you're dehydrating so they don't actually accidentally um, burn themselves. With the oven though, most people have this piece of equipment if you have a kitchen, so it's not an extra piece of equipment you have to buy. Um, it does take two to three times longer than in the dehydrator and the products also turn out a little bit darker and more brittle than if you were doing it in a dehydrator. Um, and you need to rotate or turn the product. So there's just a little more time involved with the oven drying. So what are items that you can dehydrate? Um, with fruit, um, good things are apples, cherries, grapes, peaches, etc. Things that aren't so good are things that have a higher moisture content because they take a really long time to dehydrate. So cantaloupe, rhubarb, Rhubarb just doesn't dehydrate well. Blackberries, um, oranges. Now for that overripe fruit I've been talking about that we don't really want to use for canning or freezing, this is a good time to use it in fruit leather. So um, there's recipes again online from the National Center for Home Food Preservation or in the handouts over here. Um, taking some fruit and then adding some lemon juice to it to prevent the browning. And then you can place it on a tray. These often come with a dehydrator and just spray it with some cooking spray so it doesn't stick and then you'll pour it onto the tray and then it will come out just like a, a fruit leather you can buy at the store. <clears throat> um, vegetables again, list of things that work well, the things that don't work well are also those things you don't want to freeze because they have a lot of moisture content in them. Herbs you want to get when they're young and tender um, and Herbs you can actually also dehydrate in the microwave. 
Um, you want to make sure that you wash them though and pat them dry. Um, and watch them very closely because they can spark. So you don't want to start a fire or anything. So be very careful when you're drying the herbs. Also, you can dehydrate meat, um, lean meats, game. So if you have um, a hunter or a hunter in your family, and they need to be pre-treated using either a marinade brine or a hot pickle cure. So this lists the directions for that, and there's information in the um, handouts over here on how to prepare those. But take home message is when you're doing any method of food preservation, especially canning, please, please, please make sure you're using a USDA tested and approved recipe. Um, there's been significant changes in 1994 and then also updates in 2006 and 2009. So we want to make sure we're using the latest uh, recommendations with canning. Things we want to avoid are old, outdated recipes. Um, your grandma may have a wonderful recipe for a pickle or a salsa or whatever it may be, um, but it, it probably isn't safe or matches the recommendations. Um, or the internet, um, out-of-date publications, those kinds of things. So these are places I recommend going. Um, Iowa State University Extension and Outreach has a um, food preservation page where you can download all of these resources as well. Um, the Ball Blue Book, published after 1994. Um, the So Easy to Preserve website. Um, the National Center for Home Food Preservation is listed here. And the USDA Complete Guide to Home Canning. The, oh, um, I, hmm, I think it's probably listed on the bottom of one of our publications our website but not all of these on here so I'll I'll give you some time to copy these down one last thing I wanted to highlight so this is kind of the introductory course to canning we do have more in-depth lessons um, it's a great program we have called preserve the taste of summer so you can register online and there's also a brochure with more information on it over here the first handout um, so you register online and then you're, um, you complete online lessons in the areas you're interested in and then you're eligible to attend a hands-on workshop if you register for the silver level or above. And we've actually partnered with hy V, and so we're bringing two of these workshops here to Iowa City this fall. We have a pickling workshop on Saturday, September 20th from 11 to 3. Um, these are both at the waterfront hy V in the club room. And then we have a jams and dehydrating workshop on Friday, October 3rd from 5 to 9 p.m. Um, so before you can attend the workshop, you'll need to register online and complete those lessons. And then once you've done that, um, you will need to notify me a week in advance to register for the workshop. Questions on that? And then we also have two other workshops. We have one on pressure canning and one on, oh, which one are we missing? Salsa making. Um, and we're going to be offering those next spring at the Waterfront hy V. What questions do you guys have? I have one about dehydration. What mm -hmm. do you recommend for storage afterwards? Oh, good question. With, so the question was um, how to store dehydrated products. Um, we recommend storing them in an airtight container or a plastic bag um, for about one month on your counter they'll last. Um, after you dehydrate them and put them in the bag, you want to do what we call conditioning. So you shake it um, each day to help um, distribute any moisture that might be left. So if you have one product that's still really moist, it doesn't spoil the entire batch. Or you can put them in an airtight bag and then put them in the freezer and they would last for a longer time. <laughs> Another thing I um, should mention is we have a great free service through Iowa State University Extension called Answer Line. It's a toll-free number you can call, um, and they are like having your grandma on speed dial. So if you have questions about food safety or canning or um, like stain removal, child development, any home or family question, it's a free uh, number you can call. It's 1-800-262. 3804. And their number should be listed, um, I believe, on the publications as well. And they're open Monday through Friday. Um, that's a great uh, service to take advantage of. Is there a difference in the bag, whether you use a um, regular Ziploc bag or a freezer? 
good question. Um, the freezer bags have kind of another layer of protection from that moisture loss and from the air getting in. So if you are keeping things in the freezer for an, an extended amount of time, I'd recommend using the freezer bags. Yes? I was just wondering if you had any ideas on uh, the nutrition that would be in the uh, food with the different ways of preserving it. Mm -hmm. uh, in my family, the young people just want to eat stuff raw. Mm -hmm. They think that's a lot better. And the old people want to do go all out and prepare really fancy food and uh, preserve it through the winter. And, you know, mm -hmm. when you, you can't eat it raw in the winter harvest. Yeah. So uh, they kind of have an ongoing argument about the difference in the nutrition. Sure. Good. So his question was regarding um, nutrition content of different foods canned versus um, eating it fresh. There's a lot of factors that come into play there, so I can't say definitely that one is superior to the other. I am happy when people are eating fruits and vegetables <laughs> as a dietitian. Um, that being said though, I mean, if you are canning things, you don't have to add salt to them when you're canning, but if you're adding canning, adding salt, then that's going to um, you know, increase the sodium and that's gonna make it not quite as healthy. Also, when you cooked it and then you're serving it, if you add lots of cheese or sauces or butter, um, that's going to add fat to that. So that wouldn't naturally be there. Um, but as far as just like the vegetable itself, you know, when you pick it fresh um, and freeze it right away, then you're maintaining that quality and nutrition of the item. Um, so I would say there's not significant differences between the two, but again, how you're preparing it can make a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, seal. Yeah, so her question was about old jars. Um, if it's not in good condition, I, I would recommend keeping it as maybe a family heirloom or using it for decorating but not for canning. Um, because we want the jars, we don't want lots of cracks because again, when you're, if it's cracked, it's gonna be easier to break when you're putting it under the stress of the heat and everything. Um, and also we want the lid to um, form a good seal. So if there's any chips or anything along the top of the jar, then that's gonna prevent um, a good seal from being formed. So the, the um, recipes will tell you for different size jars um, how much processing time is needed. So usually they're either quart or pint size jars that they recommend using. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Well, thank you all so much for your undivided attention.